planes are designed to fly in the air, but we do actually need to move them around on the ground as well. And how do we do that? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 14 in the AGK series. Today we're going to be taking a look at all things landing gear. It's a very simple yet essential system and hopefully by the end of the class you've got a good understanding of all the things to do with how it works. There are two main types of landing gear arrangement. The tricycle landing gear being the first we're going to talk about. It is the dominant type in modern aviation from light aircraft to jumbo jets. It consists of two main landing gear wheel assemblies positioned under the wings or the fuselage and a single smaller nose wheel. This design is good for stability during ground operations. It also means the aircraft is level with the ground, which gives a good forward visibility for the pilots and facilitates more precise ground maneuvering through nose wheel steering, which we'll talk about later. The legs of the landing gear are reinforced to be strong during linear uh, or side to side movements using bracing structures calling, called side stays. Up and down strength and resilience comes from large shock absorbers, which are called oleos. And an oleo is just like a shock absorber in a car. It consists of a combination of oil and nitrogen gas that will compress on landing to absorb the impact of the aircraft touching down. The other arrangement is known as a tail dragger. These have two main wheels forward of the aircraft's center of gravity and a smaller wheel at the tail that is free to rotate a certain amount. This configuration is also often found on classic aircraft that like you think um, of those first commercial aircraft that flew across the Atlantic, you might get a tail dragger, and they're also common in bush aircraft and agricultural aircraft. It gives the aircraft a nose up attitude on the ground, or the tail drags across the ground, hence the name. Its main advantage is that it is great for operations on unpaved surfaces such as grass or gravel. This is because we want as much nose clearance between the propeller and the surface as possible because if we wreck the propeller we can't take off again. So that high angle just means that we get a bit of extra clearance for the propeller. Tailwheel designs are generally lighter and simpler uh, when compared to tricycle designs which means lower manufacturing and maintenance costs. However, the tail dragging arrangement is less stable and controllable on the ground, which makes them harder to handle. The restricted forward visibility during taxiing as well, due to that nose high uh, attitude, also increases the difficulty of maneuvering whilst on the ground. A fixed landing gear remains permanently extended, if you like, and visible during all phases of flight. The main benefit is that it is simple, leading to lower manufacturing costs, reduced maintenance costs, and fewer potential failure points. However, this simplicity comes at the cost of a constant aerodynamic drag source, which significantly compromises cruise speed, climb performance, and fuel efficiency, and so on, all the performance of the aircraft. For this reason, fixed gear is only really found on smaller, slower aircraft, and not on aircraft designed for long or fast journeys. Retractable landing gear can be stowed within the aircraft's wing or fuselage during flight through a hydraulic or electric mechanism. And that mechanism will just lift the wheels up into the body of the aircraft. This dramatically reduces aerodynamic drag, leading to higher cruise speeds, improved climb rates and better fuel efficiency. So as soon as you enter the commercial aircraft side of things, almost all aircraft will have retractable landing gear. Retractable landing gear is more complicated though. It adds weight, maintenance costs and uh, complications due to these moving parts. We also need to have a backup system to lower the gear in case of a failure of that primary mechanism. If we lose the hydraulics in flight, for example, we still need to extend the gear. Often, this is just done through gravity. The doors and pins that hold the wheels up are released and the weight of the wheels pulls the gear down until it locks in place. You will often also see that the nose wheel of a commercial aircraft retracts forwards and that is because if the hydraulics fail and we need to do the gravity extension that we just talked about then the forward speed of the aircraft and the air hitting the aircraft will help push the nose wheel down into that locked position. If it retracted and extended the other way backwards into the body then the forward motion of the aircraft would cause difficulty in locking the wheel down. The air would basically push the wheel back up. 
On a tail drag out aircraft, there is no nose wheel, therefore no nose wheel steering. To move these aircraft around the ground, we use the aerodynamic force of the rudder and differential braking through the pedals on the ground. We basically brake on one side and not the other, and the plane rotates towards the brake that has been applied. As we travel faster, the aerodynamic force generated by the rudder increases, so we don't need to use the differential braking method at high speeds, but we almost certainly will at low speeds. In light aircraft with tricycle landing gear arrangements, often the nose wheel is mechanically linked to the rudder. Therefore, when the rudder deflects, the nose wheel also turns. This is good for turning at low speeds, but it limits the nose wheel deflection to the same as the rudder. This means that it works up to a point, but for tight turns, it isn't uh, 100% and we still might need to use a bit of differential braking, just like we did with a tail dragger aircraft. When we get to large commercial aircraft, we have nose wheel steering. This is a dedicated system where we can turn the nose wheel independently of the rudder. It will be hydraulically controlled and in the cockpit, pilots control this movement through a tiller or the pedals. The pedals will be limited in how much they can control the nose wheel steering because they are used primarily for the rudder, the, the pedals that is. The tiller, however, will have full control over the full range of motion. For example, in the A320, the nose wheel can be turned either way 75 degrees with the tiller, but the uh, rudder pedals only have a range of 6 degrees either way. This large range of motion through nose wheel steering allows for very tight turns to be made without the use of differential braking, which as you'll see in the next class when we talk about brakes is very good for brake wear and tear. The nose wheel steering input on large aircraft will also be configured to reduce the levels of turning as the speed increases. To illustrate what I mean, imagine we're turning onto the runway and we use the full 75 degrees of turn on the nose wheel through the tiller and we're traveling five knots. That would result in a nice smooth turn onto the runway with no issues. Now, as we're traveling down the runway about to take off at 100 knots, we suddenly unexpectedly and accidentally deflect the tiller the full 75 degrees. This would result in the aircraft immediately turning and causing a large amount of strain on the lateral load support structures of the landing gear. We would also likely run off the side of the runway. It would be very bad and most likely lead to a bit of an accident or an emergency situation. Therefore, to prevent this, we want to reduce the effectiveness of the tiller deflection so it becomes completely ineffective above a certain speed. When we're going fast enough, the rudder can produce all the turning force that we need as well, so we don't even need to use the nose wheel steering. It's therefore safer just to slowly disable the tiller, and that's also part of the reason why the pedals only do a six degree deflection. In the cockpit, there are various controls when it comes to landing gear that we need to think about. With a fixed landing gear, there isn't really any, but with a retractable landing gear, we need to think about a few. The main one that you've probably seen before is the gear selector. This is a lever with a round little wheel shape at the end of it, and it will also have a lock in place on the lever that means it can't be activated on the ground. This lock will be activated by small switches on the main landing gear, which are called weight on wheel switches. There is no indicator for us to see that these switches are active or not, because it should be obvious to us if we're on the ground or not. Um, in large jets though, we want some systems to operate only on the ground, like the thrust reversers on the engines, for example. We also only want to be able to extend and retract the landing gear when in the air, which is where the weight on wheel switches come in. When they detect weight on wheels, then the physical lock, the locking pin, will unlock, and it means that we can move the landing gear up and down. Near the main lever, there will be a placard, a sign basically, which will show a list of speeds. These are the limiting speeds for the landing gear. Normally it's to do with the landing gear doors, not the landing gear structure itself, but they are limits that if we don't follow, it could cause some serious damage. There will be three limits normally. VLE stands for the velocity with the landing gear extended, and it is the maximum speed that we can fly with the gear extended. These are just the A320 figures, so we've got 280 knots that we can fly with the gear down. VLO is the maximum speed to operate the landing gear, and sometimes this is broken up into two speeds as well, one for extension and one for retraction. VLE will generally be higher than VLO, 
So while we may be able to fly at 280 knots with the gear down, coming into land, we wouldn't actually be able to drop the gear, we wouldn't be able to extend the gear until we're below 250 knots, because that's what the VLO means. We can't actually move the doors and the gear itself unless we're below 250 knots. But say, for instance, we were at 240 knots, we dropped the gear, we would then be able to speed up to 280 knots if we wanted to for some reason. There's also the nose wheel steering tiller, which we saw in the previous bit of paper, which is essentially just a little handle that you can twist to move the nose wheel steering. As I said previously, this will reduce in effectiveness as the speed of the aircraft increases. Finally, we're going to talk about arguably the most important thing in the cockpit. This is the landing gear position indicator lights. On the landing gear, there are little micro sensors that will illuminate three greens on the indicator when the gear is down and locked. There is a light for each set of gear, the two main and the nose wheel. When the lights are not green, they can be off, which indicates that the gear is up and locked in the up position. Or they might show red, which means that the micro switch sensor on that uh, main or that landing gear set has not been activated. So the gear is not confirmed down and locked or up and locked. So if we're coming into land and we didn't have three greens displayed, but instead had this arrangement where we've got one green, one unilluminated and one red and green, then that means that we've got one gear that's down, one gear that's up, and one gear that's down but not confirmed locked. We don't want to land in that situation because it might mean that when we come into land, one of the gears or both of them, it's hard to tell in this situation, um, well, this one will be up, this one will be down, and this one is halfway down, I suppose. It's down but it's not locked. So we might come into land and one of the gears could fold back up into the aircraft because it is not locked. So you want to make sure you've got three greens, three greens before landing, otherwise you might get the situation where one of them collapses in on itself. Another thing to note about these lights is that the red lights almost act like a in-transit indicator. When we lower the gear on approach, the red lights will come on at first because we've told the aircraft we want the gear down. The lever is at, gonna be at the bottom position but they don't happen instantaneously. So the landing gear wouldn't be locked, therefore the red lights would come on. It would only be once it is fully extended and locked that the green lights come on and the red lights go out. The same would happen on retracting the gear. Three greens would be showing initially, then we command the gear up and the gear unlock lights, the red ones would come on until that all the lights go out. So the red lights sort of indicate this transitional period between the two states. I say this is the most important thing in the cockpit because landing with the landing gear up or having the landing gear collapse on you has caused many emergencies in the past. And you'll often find a checklist on the landing checklist that indicates that you have to check that the landing gear is down with three greens. To summarize then, there's two main arrangements. We've got a tricycle and a tail dragger. Tricycle is good for forward visibility and maneuvering around on the ground. Tail dragger is good for propeller clearance, therefore good for uh, non-tarmac surfaces. You want to keep as much distance between any rocks or anything uh, that might be on your unpaved surfaces. When the landing gear is fixed down, it's simple, but it does cause a lot of drag, meaning that we can't fly very fast and our performance is a bit limited. So we want to have probably a system where we can retract the gear. This involves opening some doors and the landing gear folding up into the aircraft and then the doors closing again to make a nice smooth aerodynamic surface whilst flying through the air. In the cockpit, we'll usually see a lever with a little wheel on it. It's just a tactile thing. You grab the lever that looks like the wheel to operate the wheels. That's essentially what it's uh, designed to uh, feel like when you're actually operating this thing. There's often a little locking pin that will use weight on wheel switches to activate and deactivate. And that means that we can inadvertently select the gear up when we're on the ground. To move the gear, we have to make sure that we are below the VLO to retract or extend it. And when we're flying around, we have to make sure that we're always below VLE when we have the gear extended. We've got the light indicators. If we've got three greens like we have here, that means that the gear is down and locked. If they're all off, it means they're up and locked up. And if we've got any red, it means that the locking uh, micro switches haven't been activated yet. 
So it might mean that the gear is in transit, or it might mean that the gear is down, but it's not locked in the down position, which could lead to a collapsed landing gear and uh, an accident when we come into land. To steer, we've basically got three methods. In a tail dragger, we can use differential braking. We apply the brakes on this side. We don't apply them on that side and it turns towards the wheel that has been braked. We also can use the rudder. Rudder basically generates an aerodynamic force from the rear of the aircraft and it will turn us around the main wheels and that's why the tail uh, wheel of a tail dragger has a little bit of freedom of movement so it can rotate around with the rudder. Um, on a tricycle small aircraft you'll have both these methods but you'll often have a nose wheel steering that is mechanically linked to the rudder. So when we deflect the rudder, the nose wheel also turns a bit and helps us turn those tight corners. Once you get to bigger aircraft, you'll have a dedicated nose wheel steering system. Basically uses a hydraulic piston to turn the nose wheel from left to right using the pedals in the aircraft or a little tiller, uh, a little uh, handle that you can turn the aircraft with. But the effectiveness and the levels of turn that you get from nose wheel steering will reduce as you increase in speed to prevent any uh, large fast changes in nose wheel steering that could cause you to turn off the runway and uh, damage the aircraft. And another reason that it reduces in effectiveness with speed is that the rudder increases in effectiveness with speed. So you don't actually have to use nose wheel steering anymore. You can just use the aerodynamic forces generated by the rudder.